I welcome Naomi Oreskes to the HKW Talks on the Anthropocene. She is Professor of the History of Science and Affiliated Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. Welcome, Thank Naomi. You. you gave a talk here at the House, and basically one argument in the talk was to say the whole discussion about the Anthropocene started already much earlier than we contextualize it at the moment. Uh, can you develop this idea a little bit more? Geologists have recognized that the human impact on the environment was growing for probably about 100 years now. So around the turn of the century, there were signs, small signs, of things changing. And one of the first people to talk about this was Svante Arrhenius, who we recognize today as the first person to point out the potential impact of greenhouse gases on the environment. But there are others as well. So there were small signs, there were people saying, look at this, pay attention, but it didn't really gain traction in a very significant way until later in the century. Did they already argue that uh, humans are not only intervening in the Earth, but are shaping it on a global scale and even on a geologic, uh, geological scale? Yes, exactly. So I spoke in my lecture about a geologist named Robert Sherlock who wrote a book called Man as a Geologic Agent, and this was exactly his argument, that the scale of human activities had now grown to be so great that it was actually matching, or in some cases even exceeding, the scale of natural processes. Do you see reasons within the sciences uh, why this was not taken up? and only at the end of the century became an issue again. Sherlock him himself acknowledged that scientists would be reluctant to, to accept what he was saying uh, for two reasons. One is he argued that it threatened the geological concept of uniformitarian. Mm -hmm. So geologists were quite committed to the idea of geological processes being characterized by the sto slow, steady accumulation of small effects. And this idea, which is generally credited to Charles Lyell, was very, very influential for Charles Darwin and really was the basis of Darwin's theory of the origin of species by natural selection, that the way we got new species, the way old species went extinct, uh, well, new species formed by the gradual accumulation, the gradual selection of very, very small variations, and species went extinct similarly, gradually. So this idea of the slow, steady accumulation of small changes was really at the heart and soul mm -hmm. of geological thinking. And Sherlock says to say to people, well, actually, there could be changes that are much more rapid than that, uh, much more abrupt and much larger. That's an idea that geologists will have a hard time accepting. So, and he was right. Yeah. So you would also argue uh, geology, uh, geologists basically for a long time couldn't deal with humans. Correct. They couldn't. In fact, not only couldn't, but wouldn't. Didn't want to, didn't think they should. Thought that the whole definition of geology as a science was a science that dealt with the natural world apart from human impacts and dealt with the world before humans had evolved. Once humans appear on the scene, then we have anthropology, yes, archaeology, yeah. and history. So what does that mean now for, for geologists, for this science, uh, that human becomes such an important geological force? It means that geologists have to really rethink their science and whole areas of investigation which previously they would have set aside, now they're reconsidering. And we see this in geological work, that increasingly geologists think that, for example, if you're studying water resources, if you're studying hydrology, you cannot study hydrology anywhere in the world and understand the systems in a meaningful way without considering the human impacts through dams, uh, through different kinds of engineering projects, groundwater pumping, irrigation. The divide between social sciences, humanities, and natural sciences on the other side, such as geology, is not only there from the side of the geologists, but also from the other side. Yes. To which extent do does this Anthropocene uh, research also trigger changes <coughs> in the social and political sciences? It absolutely does trigger changes on both sides. So increasingly we see historians, anthropologists, sociologists being much more interested in this interaction between the physical and natural world. And I see it in my own work because as a historian and sometime philosopher of earth science, when I first started working in this field, there were very few historians who were interested in yeah. the earth and especially mainstream historians pretty much ignored the natural world, um, treated it as a sort of exogenous backdrop, and increasingly mainstream historians are recognizing that we really need to discuss in a more 
thoughtful and nuanced yeah. way what that interaction looks like. But uh, the humanities, as well as natural sciences, they developed their disciplines over 200 years now, uh, basically. Uh, what does that mean for the disciplines as disciplines? Do they have to give it up? Uh, how do we, they handle the situation? Well, as you probably know, the modern disciplines were not are not actually that old. Oh, Most of yeah. them were really established in the German research universities in the yes. mid to late 19th century. So I like to say that the disciplines were not given on Mount Sinai. Okay. They are themselves historically contingent mm -hmm. means of organizing human thought and inquiry. And so they've changed before and they will change again. And the whole notion of a discipline, I mean, there's some very interesting historical work about yeah. the idea yeah. of a discipline, discipline. Yeah. you know, and the disciplining. I mean, Foucault, yes. of course, is the most yes. famous and there are others. Yeah. Um, I think that that idea is obviously already changing and mm -hmm. the very work that people are here are doing is, is evidence And, and of you that. would argue that the Anthropocene notion also triggers this process or yes, adds I, to this process. Definitely, definitely, because once we begin to think about the... In, the intimate interrelations yes. between what we call the natural versus the man-made or artificial environment, once we begin to think about the way in which human processes affect the environment and then vice versa affect us, it becomes impossible to analyze those as separate problems. Uh, when I started to get interested in the Anthropocene thesis, for me it was very interesting that natural scientists, especially geologists, mm. who are so conservative by their object, so yes, to say, yes. uh, they trigger a process which destabilizes the production of knowledge. Exactly, and it's one of the things that's so interesting about it is that it's a sort of internal destabilization. It's yes. people within their own field saying, well, wait, there are these problems that we see. I mean, ultimately, geologists are, if anything, if nothing else, they're empiricists. Yes. They see these things going yeah. on around them. And they're very acute observers. Yes. This is one of the great strengths of geology yes. is the great observational skills one develops. Yeah. So we see these changes happening, and geologists say, we, we can't ignore what we see happening yeah. in front of our eyes. And so exactly, it becomes a kind of shift from within, which then others embrace as well. It's interesting that you hint at, so to say, the methods of geology mm. in order to prove the, this case. Mm. Because mm. also from my perspective, uh, b being working in the art field and the cu uh, cultural field is it seems that the geologists have a much more direct uh, approach to the material world mm -hmm. as a lot of other sciences. Yes, I, <coughs> I think that's exactly right. And I've always thought that one of the things that's very interesting about geology as a science and one of the things that was interesting for me personally, having been trained as a geologist, is this extremely direct and intimate relationship with material objects. Yes. And I, I often felt in graduate school, I used to argue with some of my colleagues who studied philosophy of physics, that yes. the whole debate about realism and anti-realism, modernism and postmodernism, would look entirely different if it had been based on geology as the prototype science rather than on physics. So geology, to some extent, becomes the new philosophy. Well, that would be nice for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But of course, that's yeah. historically contingent as well. If yes, you ask, why did we think physics was the prototype yeah. science, yes. there are some very historically contingent yeah. reasons for yeah. that. And now we have new historically contingent reasons. So now we have all these debates in the sciences about the Anthropocene and man changing the world to an extent that it becomes a geological force. How does that translate into the political field? Well, this is where it gets very complicated, of course, because politics is more complicated and harder than geology, and because then we get into the normative sphere. And now we have this problem of who's, is this good or bad? Is this progress or is this regress? Um, if it, is it someone's responsibility? If it's bad, is someone to blame? Uh, how do we fix it if it needs to be fixed? And if it involves issues of global governance, how do we do that? We don't have good models for effective global mm. governance, mm -hmm. and yet, you know, we've heard here this week that these many of these problems demand global governance. Many of the scientists who first recognized the Anthropocene in, in our era, people like Paul Crutzen, I mean, Paul worked on the science that led to the Montreal Protocol, yes. which is one of our few successful examples of good international, successful international governance. Um, so we have that model, but when we look at climate change, for example, the problem is so much bigger uh, and the attempts we've made so far at global governance have not been successful. So now we have a whole set of complicated questions. Okay, basically on the one side you, you could say this new knowledge production taking place in the sciences triggers or is asking for restructuring politics. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what many people have said. And of course this becomes very complicated because 
it's hard enough to solve a scientific problem, and now you want to solve the problem of governance, which people have been working on for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> they haven't had too much success. Mm. So, you know, it's tricky. I think on the one hand, you could see it as a positive thing because it gives us grounds for trying to rethink questions of governance and trying to imagine better, more effective, more equitable forms of governance. Yes. On the other hand, the track record of doing that is not so good, yeah. and that makes some people say, well, maybe we need to think about this more locally, think about what yeah. can be done on a, on a smaller yeah. scale. Yeah. Is it just uh, the problem, is it because it's so complex, or they are also interests involved? Yeah, I don't actually think it's, I don't think the basic problem is that complex. I mean, actually, if we think about climate change, the basic problem is actually extremely simple. Oh. We yeah. have built an economic system based on tapping the wealth stored in fossil fuels. Mm. Those fossil fuels produce greenhouse gases which warm the atmosphere. That's actually pretty simple. That only took a minute to explain. But what do we do about it? The reality is the entire world's economic system is built on energy, and particularly the wealth of yes. the North is built on fossil fuels. So now you're saying you have to change that. You have to change the entire basis of Western civilization. That's a heavy lift, mm -hmm. right? Uh, before you said, uh, when we come to the realm of politics, we get to the normative. Mm. Uh, there is no normativity in the sciences? Ah, well, <laughs> no, of course there is, but the explicitly normative, yeah. the acknowledged yeah. normative, right? No, but uh, I mean, I could ask you, as a citizen voting for right. parties, uh, right. how do you see this as a citizen, having the knowledge you have? Well, different people view this differently. Personally, I do believe that the ideas of responsibility and accountability are terribly important here. I don't think people can be blamed for things they didn't know about and could, couldn't yes, have known about. Yes, so I don't think that anybody who was burning coal in the 19th century could be yeah. blamed for global warming. Global. They could be blamed for other kinds okay. of, you know, yes. like mining accidents yes. or ill treatment of workers, but not for global warming from greenhouse gases. But after the 1980s, when the scientific evidence becomes clear, when you have Jim Hansen testifying in the U.S. Congress, when you have the IPCC created, at that point it becomes clear that continued expansion of the use of fossil fuels is doing damage and is going to do very serious damage to the world. And then at that point, I think questions of responsibility and accountability are appropriate. And so for me, personally as a citizen, I think we should be having a quite large discussion about accountability, and then some of the questions about equity, about North and South, yeah. then can be brought to the table in the context of accountability. To some extent, when you look at the discussion in the, in the social sphere, is you have a divide of, on the one side, the experts who have the expert knowledge, on the other side, you have the normal citizens. Uh, how do you bridge this gap? Well, you know, it's interesting. For me, because I've been mostly working on this in the United States, I see the gap as actually a different one. A lot of people have paid a lot of attention to the public opinion polls, which suggest that a lot of Americans are confused. But when you look closely at the polls, it is true that people are confused, but nevertheless, the majority of American citizens basically get this issue. Mm. They may not understand it in a very deep way. Their understanding is, is shallow and easily disrupted. But most citizens do actually get it. And I think most citizens, are, you know, most people aren't stupid, right? But, uh, what? Okay. Sorry. Go, oh, but, what we, but I think the more important divide in the United States is actually between scientific experts and political power. Mm -hmm. That we have scientific experts who had a very idealistic vision of their own role. That if they simply sorted out the scientific questions and explained them mm -hmm. properly, they could yeah. hand over this knowledge. Yeah. It's a kind of transfer knowledge, yeah. transfer model. They would hand it over to politicians and politicians would act on it. Well, what scientists weren't thinking about was political power and economic power. Yeah and social, structural power. So there's a tremendous amount of power in the hands of people whose interests are threatened by this whole question. And we've seen in the United States the way in which those people and those organizations have exerted power and used it to block policy action, even in places, even in states um, like California or like Massachusetts, where the population is totally on board and wants action. Thanks a lot for this Thank you. wonderful Great talk. Yeah, um, good to talk with you. Great.